On the 4th of May 2024, Berkshire Hathaway hosted its much-awaited annual general meeting. Tens of thousands from around the world attend the meeting, and millions more tune into the broadcast. This was also the first meeting without Charlie Munger, Berkshire's longtime vice chairman, who passed away in late 2023, just shy of his 100th birthday. Buffett inadvertently took control of Berkshire Hathaway in the 1950s, when the company was a textile mill with its best days behind it. Charlie, in 1965, promptly advised me, Warren, forget about ever buying another company like Berkshire. But now that you control Berkshire, add to it wonderful businesses, purchase at fair prices, and give up buying fair businesses at wonderful prices. In other words, abandon everything you learned from your hero, Ben Graham. It works, but only when practiced at small scale. With much backsliding, I subsequently followed his instructions. Since then, the company has grown into the largest American company by net worth, employs about 400,000 people, and commands a market capitalization of close to $900 billion. While Buffett, Munger, and Berkshire are household names, how many of you actually know what Berkshire does? In this video, I'm going to explain Berkshire's plethora of businesses, assets, and what makes the company a unique conglomerate. Despite the length of the video, I want to emphasize that I only discuss the material businesses and investments of Berkshire. There are many more investments and businesses that I do not cover. That should tell you everything you need to know about the sheer scale of Berkshire's empire. Buffett and Munger's Berkshire is built around one simple but powerful idea. Buy good businesses run by able and honest managers and then get out of their way. They describe it as decentralization to the point of abdication. The year is 1985. One Saturday, a consultant, a class of professionals generally considered distasteful at Berkshire, brings along an Indian engineer to meet Warren Buffett. His name is Ajit Jain. Over the succeeding four and a half decades, Jain transformed Berkshire's insurance operations into the juggernaut we know today. Jain had no prior experience in the insurance industry and began his career at IBM. Yet, Buffett saw something in him that propelled him to hand over the keys to the kingdom. How many people, who themselves have tasted tremendous success at an early age, have the maturity and humility to do that when they see someone better equipped to lead their business? Not many, I would wager. Remember, decentralization to the point of abdication. Here's what Buffett wrote about Jen in the 2010 annual letter. Ajith ensures risk that no one else has the desire or the capital to take on. His operation combines capacity, speed, decisiveness, and most importantly, brains in a manner that is unique in the insurance business. Yet he never exposes Berkshire to risks that are inappropriate in relation to our resources. Indeed, we are far more conservative than most large insurers in that respect. In the past year, Ajith has significantly increased his life reinsurance operation, developing annual premium volume of about two billion that will repeat for decades. From a standing start in 1985, Ajith has created an insurance business with float of 30 billion and significant underwriting profits, a feat that no CEO of any other insurer has come close to matching. By his accomplishments, he has added a great many billions of dollars to the value of Berkshire. Even kryptonite bounces off Ajith. Berkshire was built on the back of its insurance business, which remains its biggest and most important pillar. Berkshire operates both insurance and reinsurance businesses, all of which are overseen by the legendary Ajit Chen. Berkshire's insurance subsidiaries provide insurance and reinsurance of property and casualty risks, as well as life and health risks worldwide. The insurance business assumes the risk of loss from persons or organizations that are directly subject to the risks. Such risks may relate to property, casualty, life, accident, health, financial or other perils that arise from an insurable event. In reinsurance activities, the insurer assumes defined portions of risk that other direct insurers or reinsurers assumed in their own insuring activities. In other words, it allows primary insurers to offload certain risks to a reinsurer. The insurance business in America specifically is a regulatory maze comprising individual state regulators and a multitude of regulations and laws. Each of the state regulators, in turn, participate in the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, or the NAIC. Therefore, every subsidiary under Jane's oversight must navigate dozens of state and federal regulations and requirements. This is a cumbersome, time-consuming and expensive process, 
having the financial backing and experience to deal with all of this is a material advantage. Berkshire also operates overseas insurers and reinsurers in countries like the UK, Germany and Australia, compelling them to also comply with complicated international regulations. Scale allows Berkshire to take on risk no other insurer or reinsurer can afford to. The advantage of this is most apparent in the mega catastrophe or mega cat reinsurance operations, one of the most important components of Berkshire's insurance business. The purpose of this business is to protect a client against exceptionally rare but exceptionally expensive events. Think of an earthquake in a major city. The event may happen once in a millennium, but the cost would be the GDP of a medium-sized country. Pertinently, the list of companies that can insure against such risk generally begins and ends with Berkshire. Think of another important point in the example I just mentioned. Clients are concerned about events that may not occur for several decades or centuries. Therefore, they need to be confident that the insurer or reinsurer will exist when the event does occur, which may not happen for a long time. In this regard, Berkshire's potential for longevity stands alone. The company's incredible balance sheet and diversified cash-generating operations have created an organization that should thrive for decades. Competitive advantages come in all forms, often beyond anything you can see in reported financials. Another important advantage of Berkshire's chosen insurance operations is the ability to reprice most of its exposure on an annual basis. This protects against most long-duration risks, as well as ever-evolving risks and dynamics in the insurance business. Most notably changes in technology, climate change, and creeping social inflation in the form of court-ordered legal payments beyond the scope of the original insurance contract. The final overarching advantage of Berkshire's insurance operations is intangible and the effects thereof hard to quantify. By virtue of being housed within the Berkshire Fortress, no agent of the insurance group is compelled to meet preordained quarterly or annual targets. As a result, insurance or reinsurance is only written when the price is worth the assumed risk. Think about that for a second. Since your competitors are forced to sell a minimum number of products to meet centrally mandated targets, the agents, often inadvertently, open up their principles to risk disproportionate to the premium received. As a result, such companies may show consistent growth right until the point they blow up. Berkshire, on the other hand, can simply sit back and wait for favorable market conditions and pricing without needlessly chasing growth when prices aren't favorable. Nobody personifies this patient approach in insurance better than Ajit Jain himself. I highly recommend listening to his answer at the last meeting on the potential for growth in cyber insurance to better understand his views on patient underwriting. Berkshire's insurance business has three divisions, Geico, Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group, and Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group. Before explaining each division, it is vital to understand float. Float is the money in the form of premium customers pay upfront to buy insurance. Float has a distinct advantage of being paid upfront by the customer, with claims being paid down the line. Think of it in working capital terms. How great would it be if all your customers paid for your goods well in advance of you having to deliver them, with the possibility that you may never have to deliver the goods? As wonderful as Float can be, investors should remember it ultimately must be repaid, which may take a long time. Often, it takes many years to truly realize poor underwriting at an insurer or reinsurer. Unfortunately, when poor underwriting practices do come to light, there may be little that can be done. Now, the value of float is dependent on the person in control of it. Given that it is a liability that should be claimed in the future, most insurance companies invest their float primarily in fixed income instruments to prevent capital erosion. This is where having the greatest investor of all time is particularly advantageous. Using the float, Buffett embarked on a remarkable investment journey, buying up wonderful businesses that is investing primarily in equity rather than debt. These investments, comprising investments in both private and listed entities, allowed Berkshire to generate materially higher returns on investment. This was a marked competitive advantage of Berkshire, and an advantage that compounded over time. It's amazing that the gigantic positions of Berkshire in Coca-Cola, Apple, American Express, and many other great businesses are outcomes of a decision to enter the insurance business in 1957. But more on this later. Geico is focused on auto insurance to private passengers across America and is the third largest such company in the country. As an interesting aside, Buffett has publicly stated that on his 100th birthday, scheduled for August 30th, 2030, Geico will dislodge State Farm as the single largest auto insurer in America. In this regard, it's also important to note that Todd Combs has been made CEO of Geico to course correct 
and enhance the company's focus on data. Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group comprises a number of individual insurance companies, including National Indemnity, Berkshire Hathaway Home State, and the recently acquired Allegheny Corp's property and casualty operation. Each of these caters to a different insurance requirement, ranging from commercial automobile insurance to workers' compensation coverage, and executive and professional insurance to physician's insurance. Interestingly, National Indemnity was one of Buffett's first major control acquisitions at Berkshire. He purchased sister companies National Indemnity and National Fire Insurance in 1967 for $8.6 million, which is about $80 million in today's terms. Berkshire purchased the companies from Jack Ringwald, who would routinely get fed up with some development or the other and threaten to sell the businesses. Buffett seized upon one such opportunity to buy what would prove to be the jewel in Berkshire's property casualty insurance crown. In his trademark humorous style, Buffett subsequently described this behavior offering Walt as Jack being in heat. Today, National Indemnity is the largest property casualty insurance company in the world by net worth. The insurance float of Berkshire, combined with National Indemnity, was about $30 million at the time of the purchase. 56 years later, that number is a cool $169 billion. That's a compounded growth rate of close to 17% for over half a century. Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group comprises Berkshire's global reinsurance operations and offers a wide range of coverages on property, casualty, life and health risks to insurers and reinsurers in 26 countries. Major subsidiaries in this include Genry and Transri. The Reinsurance Group covers a wide range of products, including property, casualty, life, health, retroactive and periodic payment annuity. An important point to note is that despite its sprawling operations, the reinsurance group is Berkshire's only play in the life insurance business. Life insurance is often seen as a quasi-investment product, making such insurers quasi-mutual funds. To avoid this duality, Berkshire has avoided primary life insurance. Now back to float. Berkshire's investments, including its insurance float, is managed by Buffett and two deputies, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler. Todd and Ted manage about 35 billion between them, but the lion's share of Berkshire's investments remain in the hands of Buffett, who has repeatedly said that capital allocation remains a primary job of Berkshire's CEO. Investing float is an important part of the economics of an insurance company. Through Berkshire, float is invested in listed equities, government bonds, and private businesses. Major acquisitions using these funds include the purchase of whole businesses like Precision Cast Parts and BNSF, as well as portions of companies, such as the part ownership of Apple and American Express. The next major pillar of the Berkshire Empire is Burlington Northern Santa Fe, or BNSF, which operates one of the largest railroad systems in America. BNSF was acquired in 2010 for about $26 billion. Today, the value of the company is close to $150 billion. BNSF is particularly interesting because of its tangible and intangible assets and advantages. Railroads are, over long distances, the most efficient and cost-effective transport system, creating material incentives to use them for transportation for both economic and environmental considerations. So what makes BNSF and railroads efficient? First, on average, fuel efficiency of trains is many times that of trucks. Additionally, over the years, BNSF has continuously upgraded its locomotives to make them more eco-friendly. BNSF also consistently increases the length of its trains as well as its usage of alternate fuels. An interesting point to note is that BNSF has not adopted precision railroading in the way its competitors have. While precision railroading is generally thought of as a more profitable system, BNSF has opted for a more traditional customer-dependent scheduling system involving contractual agreements of varying durations, common carrier published prices, or company quotations. This long-term focus on what the customer deems more beneficial should create greater value over time. This is an important aspect of BNSF no longer being a public company unlike its peers. The pressure to create near-term profits to fund dividend payments is largely eliminated. This allows the company to plow back more into the business and think long-term. This advantage is noticeable in Berkshire's energy business as well. These, though, are some of the more obvious advantages of BNSF. What about ones less so? One example is the port connectivity. Goods will always need to be transported across large distances, and therefore, existing connectivity is an enormous advantage. Building such connectivity from scratch is prohibitively expensive. Therefore, the entry of new competition is presumably prevented. Additionally, the company owns the invaluable land and rights of way. These are assets that cannot realistically be replicated. There is another advantage to BNSF being housed within Berkshire. 
as it transports all major categories of cargo, it offers Buffett a window into the true state of the American economy before any official macro data is available. Effectively, on a real-time basis, Berkshire's head office knows demand-supply dynamics of major goods and commodities. This is manna from heaven for any investor. The third major pillar of the Berkshire empire is its utilities and energy business, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. BHE's domestic regulated energy interests comprise four regulated US utility companies serving approximately 5.3 million retail customers and five US interstate natural gas pipeline companies with approximately 21,000 miles of operated pipeline, having a design capacity of approximately 21 billion cubic feet of natural gas as per day. Other energy businesses include electric transmission and distribution operations in Great Britain and Canada, a diversified portfolio of mostly renewable independent power projects and investments, and a liquefied natural gas export, import, and storage facility. BHE also oddly owns Home Services of America, a residential real estate brokerage firm in the US, and a large network of residential brokerage franchises in the US. Generally, US utilities have an exclusive right to serve retail customers within the service territories. Historically, state regulatory commissions have established retail electric and natural gas rates on a cost of service basis, which are designed to allow utility the opportunity to recover with each state regulatory commission deems to be its utility's reasonable cost of providing services, including the opportunity to earn a fair and reasonable return on its investments based on its cost of debt and equity. The retail electric rates of the US utilities are generally based on the cost of providing traditional bundled services, including generation, transmission, and distribution services. Simply put, as per US regulations, the concerned regulator determines the rate of return on capital a utility can earn. Therefore, cost increases are not necessarily transferable to customers. This is where the advantage of the Berkshire umbrella is most evident. Unlike publicly listed peers, BHE need not pay annual dividends. If required, it can reinvest far more than competitors, enabling it to scale more and faster. This has also made BHE a preferred choice for many state regulators that have greater confidence in the propensity of the upkeep and continuity of service of BHE than many competitors. Buffett and Munger have for decades spoken of the importance of look-through earnings. When you own a portion of a company, you effectively have a proportionate right to the earnings of that company. So as an investor, it is necessary to understand the effective earning power of an investment. The power of look-through earnings is visible in Berkshire's fourth major pillar, its investment in Apple. Today, Berkshire owns close to 6% of the tech giant, which stake has increased over time through Apple's share buybacks. At its peak, the holding was worth over $180 billion. In 2023, Apple earned approximately 100 billion in profit, meaning that Berkshire effectively earned 6 billion through its stake in the tech giant. However, that number doesn't show up in any reported financials of Berkshire, except any dividend that Apple may declare. Through the stake in such a powerful cash generator, Berkshire has increased its own earning power, but more on Berkshire's investments later. In addition to these four pillars, Berkshire has a diverse long tail of businesses. Berkshire's most recent major control acquisition was Pilot Traveler Center. Operating under the names Pilot or Flying J, the company manages travel centers across the US and Canada. It also wholesales and retails fuels through company-owned and third-party centers. In 2023, PTC sold over 16 billion gallons of fuel. PTC's travel centers act as rest stops on highways, a critical service for, among others, long-haul truckers. Somewhat incongruously, the company also manages a water disposal center for oil fields. Berkshire has a meaningful presence in the manufacturing sector through numerous disparate businesses, divided into three categories, industrial products, building products, and consumer products. The industrial products businesses manufacture components for aerospace and power generation applications, specialty chemicals, metal cutting tools, and a variety of other products, primarily for industrial use. The Building Products Group produces prefabricated and site-built residential homes, flooring products, insulation, roofing, and engineered products, building and engineered components, paint and coatings, and bricks and masonry products. The Consumer Products Group manufactures and distributes recreational vehicles, batteries, and various apparel, footwear, and other products. The largest company among these is Precision Castbots, which was acquired in 2015 for $37 billion, one of Berkshire's largest ever investments. The company manufactures complex components for the aerospace and energy sectors, 
However, its products also find applications in other critical sectors, such as defense, medical equipment, and pollution control. While the purchase was lauded at the time, the jury is still out on whether this was an effective use of Berkshire's capital. Other major businesses within industrial products are Lubrizol, a global specialty chemical and performance material company, IMC, which is one of the largest multinational manufacturers of consumable precision carbide metal cutting tools and sells 95 billion units annually at an average price below 10 cents a unit. Marmin, which in itself is a conglomerate operating in a plethora of industries, including food and beverages, water treatment and plastic components, and CTB, a designer, manufacturer and marketer of a wide range of agricultural systems and solutions for preserving grain, producing poultry, pigs and eggs, and for processing poultry, fish, vegetables, and other foods. The Building Products Division has six main businesses. Clayton Homes, Shaw Industries, Johns Mansville, MyTech, Benjamin Moore, and Acme. Clayton offers on-site and off-site housing and modular homes. Shaw is one of America's largest manufacturers of carpets, flooring products, and sporting turfs. Johns Mansville focuses on roofing and insulation, while MyTech sells construction software and hardware in the residential and commercial building markets. Benjamin Moore is a paints and coatings company, and Acme is a leading manufacturer of bricks and concrete blocks. The Consumer Products Division sells recreational vehicles or RVs, trailers, and boats through Forest River, apparel and footwear through Fruit of the Loom, Garin, and BH Shoe Holdings, including household brands like Garanimals and Brooks, alkaline and lithium batteries through Duracell, toys through Jazzwares, and precious metals, jewelry, and gems through Richline. The next collection of businesses comprised Berkshire's service and retail ventures. Some of these were once important businesses to Berkshire, but their salience has reduced over time as the major pillars have ballooned in size. Among the service businesses, the largest is McLean, which provides wholesale distribution of grocery, food service, and alcohol to convenience stores, discount retailers, wholesale clubs, drug stores, military bases, quick service restaurants, and casual dining restaurants, including Walmart, 7-Eleven, and Yum! Brands. Flight Safety is a world leader in professional aviation training and flight simulators. The company manages simulators in countries around the world and trains pilots, technicians, and attendants on a wide variety of aircraft. Next time you're on a plane, there's a good chance your pilot trains on a flight safety simulator. NetJets is one of Berkshire's most well-known companies and a pioneer in private aviation. It enables customers to acquire a specific percentage of a certain aircraft type and allows customers to utilize the aircraft for a specified number of flight hours annually. When you see a celebrity posting a video getting out of a private jet, there's a good chance it's a NetJet aircraft. Other businesses in this collection include TTI, focused on distribution of electrical components, Extra Corporation, a lessor of transportation equipment, International Dairy Queen, which services 7,500 quick service restaurants under brands like Dairy Queen and Orange Julius, and IPS Integrated Project Services, which services the healthcare sector primarily. Berkshire also owns multiple retailing businesses. The largest among these is Berkshire Hathaway Automotive, which manages 83 dealerships selling new and used vehicles, primarily in Arizona and Texas. Major brands sold through these dealerships include Toyota, Lexus, General Motors, and Ford. Berkshire owns four home furnishing retailers as well including the now-famous Nebraska Furniture Mart, R.C. Willie, Star Furniture, and Jordan's Furniture. Berkshire also sells jewelry through retailers like Borsheim's, Helzberg's, and the Ben Bridge Corporation. Seize Candy, one of Buffett's first acquisitions after taking over Berkshire, and his largest at the time, continues to sell chocolates and candy, primarily on the West Coast. While the company has little significance to Berkshire's profitability now, it helped lay the foundation for the Berkshire we know today. The purchase of Seize in 1972 funded several acquisitions and investments over the years, and remains one of Buffett and Mungo's greatest decisions. Other smaller retail businesses of Berkshire include the Pampered Chef, Oriental Trading, and Detlev Louis Motorrad. Berkshire truly is a giant conglomerate, representing a cross-section of the American economy. But before you think we're done, there's one major component of the empire yet to explore, Berkshire's investment portfolio. Over the decades, Berkshire has built arguably the greatest non-government-funded public markets portfolio in the world. Major positions include Apple, Bank of America, American Express, Coke, Chevron, and Kraft Heinz. The market value of these holdings is an eye-watering $350 billion. Before you get back on your chair though, you should know that there's another 182 billion in cash waiting to be deployed as well, which number increases by over 3 billion a month among recent investments 
the investments that maybe do not get the attention they deserve are the investments in five of Japan's largest conglomerates. Itochu, Marubeni, Mitsubishi, Mitsui, and Sumitomo. These investments have been funded primarily by yen-denominated bonds, and it's evidence of Berkshire's desire to partner with like-minded businesses globally. So we know what Berkshire does now, but the question remains, why does Berkshire continue to operate this conglomerate-style system? There are two primary reasons why Berkshire is better off not spinning off individual business units. First, the structure is tax efficient and allows a free transfer of resources across various subsidiaries and the parent. While Berkshire's subsidiaries are given operational freedom, they are directed to transfer excess cash to headquarters, where such funds can be gainfully redeployed. And second, the absence of public scrutiny allows management of each of these businesses to operate with a long-term owner mindset. No annual targets are set by headquarters, nor is there any compulsion to regularly report earnings to investors, thereby eliminating the need for window dressing financials. So what is the end result of this constellation of businesses? In 2023, Berkshire's operating on it, that is earnings without the meaningless inclusion of unrealized capital gains and losses, was an astounding $37.4 billion. One of Buffett and Mungo's most commendable traits has been the steadfastness with which they have stuck to core principles, unmoved by individual events and the goings-on in the world. The key principle when acquiring or investing in businesses has been the propensity of the acquiry or investee business to deploy large sums of capital at meaningful future returns. Additionally, once they owned such a company, it took a lot for them to sell. As they say repeatedly, there are very few truly great businesses in the world. Owning them over long periods of time is the surest way to wealth beyond measure. Since the 90s, Buffett has had to contend with questions regarding his mortality. The fear of his death has concerned shareholders for three decades now. It's funny that Buffett has operated for so long that his successors now have to face questions on succession while he's still around. I know this video was a lot to digest. And like I said, there are many more similar business units and investments I haven't even covered. But I trust you found the video useful. And it helps you understand the incredible empire two men from Omaha have built. The word genius gets thrown around a lot. Maybe the true test of genius is the ability to make quantum leaps rather than incremental gains in a chosen field. It is fair to say Buffett and Munger are worthy recipients of this description in the arena of business and investing. The world has produced wealthier entrepreneurs in them, but in some ways, their genius stands alone. Thanks for watching, Sensei Kujaku.